My name is Ryan Chapman. I am the author of Forensics 528. I was formerly an instructor for Forensics 610, reverse engineering malware for SANS. I taught that for about two years before I embarked on the course development journey that took about a year and a half. And for my day job, I work, and this is conveniently placed advertising. You can read it in the front. For Palo Alto Unit 42, I work as an IR consultant for them. And I also help run a conference called CactusCon. So many of you in the local area may never heard of it, but CactusCon.com, go check us out. It's local in Phoenix, Arizona, and the United States. So we call it CactusCon because we live in the desert. Oh, how cute is that? All right, now on this slide, I've included a picture, well, a little you know, AI-generated cutesy picture of myself, but the real focus here is on my daughter. My daughter, who I call my boogie butt, she's my boogie, You'll notice I'm highlighting some blue ribbons here. She's really, really in to English horse riding. And it turns out it's not exactly a cheap endeavor. <laughs> so I work primarily to support that right there. <laughs> so I usually just include it like, hey, look, this is why one of the reasons I do what I do. The other reason, reasons why I do what I do is to help everyone deal with this threat because it is not going away. It is only going up and up and up. And yet the media, the media, whoever the media is, but you see these reports, ransomware is going down. Absolutely not, not the case at all. So, all right, my website is here. I have a number of other presentations and articles and things you can check out. If you wanna do so, awesome, but well, let's get going. So we are going over some of the content directly from our new Forensics 528 Ransomware for Incident Responders course. I see some of my this week's students sitting here and they're like, I'm here to support you, but they're gonna be potentially a little bored because we just talked about all this stuff this week. All right, so I'm just basically ripping some things from the course and presenting it to you and hopefully you find it useful. As a note, I also help run the Ransomware Summit through SANS. This is our second year. We'll be rocking in June, June 23rd. Yeah, there it is on the slide of this year. So our call for papers just closed and we are now selecting our talks and I would really appreciate all the love and support. It's a free summit. It's a virtual summit. So come check us out. Last year we had some great talks. If you go to the URL on the screen here, for528.com slash summit 23, you can learn more about the upcoming summit. If you go to summit 22, you can actually get a link to the YouTube playlist of last year's talks. So go check them out. They're plentiful and they're pretty darn amazing. All right, our agenda today. Now, the first thing I put in most of my discussions, talks, whatever about ransomware is that tagline right there. Ransomware sucks. Why? Because it does suck. It is a huge impact to businesses and organizations around the world. And it is only becoming more and more of a problem. And I think it sucks. So you will often hear me say that it does suck. So that's gonna be our kind of overview of ransomware. That's what we'll be talking about. And then we're gonna get into ransomware operator tooling. What kind of tools are the threat actors using and implementing within hopefully not your, 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 but the Royal Your environments. The more you learn about them, the better you'll be able to prevent them, to detect them early on, maybe to avoid data exfiltration and or encryption and so on and so forth. We'll also be talking about PS exec, by a show of hands here, at least in the room, on the camera, people at home, go for it, right? Show of hands, how many of you are familiar with PS Exec? How many of you expect to find it within your organization? There's a ton of hands, for everyone online, there's a ton of hands up right now, right? PS Exec is a standard sys internals tool. There's a reason I named that section for tonight's presentation, all hail the king, baby, because it is used so commonly and ransomware attacks for a multitude of things, and we'll talk about those things. And then we're gonna talk about the bane of our existence when it comes to ransomware, truly data exfiltration. So I'm not gonna focus so much on the encryption portion of the attacks, or specifically the actual payloads, what we call the actual payload or the cryptor. I wanna focus more on what the threat actors do and the tools that they use to take your data and take it out of your network. These days, we're finding a, a marked increase of not using encryptors at all, but rather going for pure data extortion. So I work for Palo Alto, Unit 42. We just put out a couple last week, I believe, our new report, and we changed it from the ransomware report to the ransom and extortion report. Because from 2021, we had fewer than 2% of cases. I don't know how that's a two, but sure. 
where we only had extortion to now around 20% of the cases that we fielded as a consulting firm where we had data extortion, but we did not experience an encryption event. There's a multitude of reasons for that. We talk about a ton of them in the course. For now, let's focus on some of the tools that these actors are using to take your stuff and hopefully try to stop them from doing so. And then we'll end up with some general hunting tips and tricks that hopefully you can implement within your own environments. All right, ransomware sucks. How much does ransomware suck? Let me give you an example. This is a screenshot of our network range that we created for this course. This range was left vulnerable by me on purpose overnight for no more than 10 hours. It was probably like six or seven hours. I don't really sleep a whole lot to be honest. So I had the range all set up and we were going to generate our data set for this class. This is about a year and a half ago. It's been in development for a while. When I had the range set up, I had a password and I believe it was capital W winter one, two, three, exclamation point, at sign Octothorpe or a pound sign basically. And I had that vulnerable password as part of the whole thing to talk about how insecure passwords can lead to problems. As I slept, this happened. This is not our red team. We were working with a team called Red Siege. They were our red team. They were going to come in and I had very explicit instructions for them to follow. This wasn't on that darn instruction list. So I woke up and it was hilarious because I thought to myself, what if I leave this insecure, right? Technically insecure. And I go to sleep and I wake up and someone's fiddled with the network, right? What would I find? And I thought it would be hilarious. I had no idea I would literally find that our own range was ransom, right? Was this a targeted attack? No, someone or some system, or it looks like kind of an automated attack to be honest, but someone basically found that remote desktop protocol was open on the IP address in Amazon Web Services where I happen to have the range hosted. This particular server was one of our terminal services servers. It was just, someone just found it. And how'd they get the password? They either stuffed credentials or they literally brute forced it. I saw a ton of failed login attempts and then eventually they got it within less than 10 hours and i woke up to an encrypted range all 10 servers in the range were encrypted and i was like i don't think you can find a better way to show how much ransomware sucks than to basically have your own range ransom before you even get to do what you meant to do with it right so i did it on purpose thinking gosh i wish something would happen and boom it happened that's how much ransomware sucks all right what we know as ransomware, what we've known as ransomware for many, many years now, we basically taught ourselves that there's an executable, there's a binary or better yet a piece of malware that when executed within an environment locks down or encrypts a machine, either a full disk encryption or a multitude of files like we see these days. That is the ransomware definition of yesteryear. These days, ransomware has evolved and it's continuing to evolve. One of the things that we see is the advent of what we call humor. At least I call it humor. There's no approved de jure acronym. I'm trying to make that the one. So you use that. <laughs> All right. So human operated ransomware is a term that Microsoft coined in 2020, but it's the advent of basically an ecosystem where you have humans who go in, break into an environment or into a network or simply purchase that access through often what's known as initial access brokers or IABs. They get into the environment and then rather than simply just allowing ransomware to run on one machine, right? The actual cryptor or the payload, their job is to escalate their privileges and move laterally around the environment to get to the high profile devices that then have access to a greater breadth of that environment. So what are those gonna be? What do you think? Just yell it out. What do they wanna to get to in order to, to have a greater access in the environment? DCs, domain control. I heard a bunch of, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and then DCs, domain controllers. Sometimes print servers, but if you're familiar with how Active Directory functions in a Windows network environment, the domain controllers are what basically run the entire environment, right? Well, most machines have the ability to communicate with the DC and need that ability and therefore the vice versa occurs. So the threat actors try to basically get to the DCs and from there, they can then use a deployment methodology. And you know what they use the most often to deploy the ransomware? They use whatever you use. 
So what's your deployment tool? If you use GPOs, group policy objects, they'll use that. If you use SCCM, they'll use that. If you use PDQ deploy, you see where I'm going with this. They love to just use what you use. The piping is already there. You probably already have your antivirus or endpoint protection things basically saying, oh, don't worry about that. That's where we deploy software. And that's what they want because they want to push their ransomware there, right? Good times. All right, so the humans being involved in the overall attack, they carry out attacks that basically mirror the advanced persistent threat attacks that we've known to come and love you know, for many, many years now. So that's one thing. The other thing that really just made ransomware freaking skyrocket is the advent of ransomware as a service. Everyone here is familiar with multi-level marketing, right? Pyramid schemes, essentially, right? Where you help each other make money kind of thing. That's how ransomware works these days. Many, many, many of the groups you hear about are actually what's known as RAS groups. You don't have to know how to develop ransomware. All you need to know how to do is how to basically follow a playbook or a runbook because you have a dedicated group of developers. They make the ransomware. They set up the infrastructure and then they basically just lease it out. In fact, it's basically an option where sometimes you can buy into the program and sometimes they just give it to you. They use a builder that they create to build specific samples just for you as the affiliate. And I don't, I don't mean like you, you, hopefully, <laughs> but the royal, you, right? Whoever's doing this. When you become an affiliate, the way it works is the affiliates are actually what they call, right? A lot of these threat groups speak Russian, or at least they communicate primarily in Russian. So what they call themselves is a pen tester, just like we call ourselves, right? In the community, right? A pen tester. They call themselves pen testers. And they will get basically hired. They even have recruiting services and groups that all kind of work together to form this ecosystem. So we're not just talking about a piece of malware that gets emailed or blasted out via email. We're talking about threat groups that break into your environments, carry out an entire attack campaign. And at the very end of it, that's when the ransomware is actually deployed. Okay, the actual cryptor, if you will. The split is often something akin to 30-70 where the affiliate is actually getting the lion's share. They're actually getting around 70%. You might think, well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it makes a lot of sense because it's very enticing for individual affiliates to then be like, oh, so I can just go work for Lockbit and I get 70% of each ransom? Well, that's kind of nice. And meanwhile, groups like Lockbit, which is one of the largest groups out there, they go, yeah, we'll just take 30, but you know, they've got hundreds of affiliates. So they just keep breaking the dough in and ravaging our networks, unfortunately. This image is from Northwave Security. I've got the, their permission to use this guy, and it gives a really good breakdown of the various roles that you see involved with ransomware. On the left-hand side, we have what's known as the intrusion access broker, excuse me, I always call it intrusion, the initial access broker, and there you go. Their job is to get into the environment. They want to break in and many times they will stop there. Once they receive valid credentials, once they maintain persistence, they yeah. might deploy their own malware. They might deploy something like Cobalt Strike. I have some more notes on that coming up. Whatever they do to maintain access so they can get in whenever they want, they will typically go to a dark net marketplace and then just offer it for sale. And then someone buys it and usually the people who buy it, what are they? They're the actual ransomware affiliates. They then carry out the attacks. You can buy access for as little as 10 bucks these days. It's actually very unnerving how easy this is for folks to gain access to environments. The affiliates, they carry out the actual dirty deeds. When you think a ransomware actor broke in here, right? Who broke in? An affiliate. Let me give you a quick example here. I have a network share from my class. It's at for528.com slash share. I'll zoom in. And I'll do a little dingle hopper here. And okay, I crossed it out. <laughs> Anyways, if you go to slash share, these are files that we share out to my class. They're open to anyone. You can go grab them. That's part of why I'm sharing it and showing it here. And I have a section in here, go away, called leaks. And under leaks, I have Conti. There was a group called Conti that basically kind of closed up shop and early in Q1, the end of Q1, 2022, because they suffered a massive leak. And if you wonder what kind of things were leaked, some of these things, 
in here, I have translations of a manual that they used to provide to their affiliates. I'm going to full screen this. It's called Cobalt Strike Manuals V2 Active Directory. It is a manual. It's a playbook. It's a run book that was designed by the developers. Well, they worked with some other affiliates and basically was provided then to new affiliates. So they would say, here's your specific version of our ransomware. We want you to get this into as many organizations as you can. And by the way, if you want to know how to do the dirty deeds, just follow this manual. And this is just one of many that they provided, by the way. They provided training. In fact, there's even, should I say this? Too late. There's even examples that they leaked out that they were providing SANS content to their affiliates. They actually had SANS content that they were providing, like actual on-demand courses that they had packaged up. <laughs> I don't know if I should have said that, but I just did. So, <laughs> so they're like, when you first get in, what do you do? You find out where are you and what's that company worth? How do you do that? You go check. Owler and Monta and Zoom Info and Rocket Rich. Then you enumerate the environment, right? You look, these are various commands here, like uh, looking NL tests uh, is basically testing the network to see what domain controllers are around, what domain trusts are around. It's all just like step by step. They just go boop, 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 right? And it's kind of like if, then, else, that state stuff throughout this manual. The very next step, they, the translation is removing the ball, eh, not so much. But what do they do? They invoke ShareFinder. It's a tool that does what? It finds, you'll never guess, shares. Why? Well, duh, why? But the next thing is they even say, hey, when you find shares, look for these kinds of things, financial documents, accounting. Like it is literally a playbook for how to attack an organization. We provide this translated version and the original one to our students so that they can do the exact opposite. They can put preventions in place and detections and things of that nature. So anyway, I'll digress. The data managers, their job is literally to be a data warehouse manager. So the data that gets exfiltrated in these attacks oftentimes will go to a data manager. And the manager, their job is to categorize and tag. They'll go, oh, that's an invoice. Oh, that's a project bill. Oh, that's a way bill or, or that's this. And they'll set it up such that they can more easily extort the victim because they have all these amazing documents and they know exactly what they have on hand. A lot of times during ransomware negotiations, and by the way, one of the roles is to be the negotiator for the ransomware team, basically, right? One of their tactics is to pull your insurance documents. And so that when they say, we want X million, and you say, nah, -uh, don't got it. They say, actually, <laughs> we know that you are covered for that. So, you know, nice try kind of thing. Now, the ransomware operators, their job is to upkeep the name brand, to develop the ransomware, to set up the actual infrastructure. But they're not primarily the ones you'll actively be dealing with. That's the affiliates. And what we're seeing even more of these days is this horrible little role right here. Hell is the chaser, right? It's identified or uh, denoted with because that's what they do. There's a group called SunCrypt and they actually left a voicemail at one point. They became very, very popular. Technically, if you go to the course share and you go to example ransom notes and go to alphabetically SunCrypt, it's not exactly a ransom note, but it's a WAV file that I've uploaded there. It's the voicemail, you can listen to it. It's a bit unnerving. It's actually hilarious at first until you realize how serious it is. They're doing that at scale now. These chasers, they're calling all kinds of people. More about that coming up. All right, let's move on. Speaking of which, the types of extortion. The first level of extortion for a while now has been, well, duh, your environment and your files are encrypted. You cannot get them back, right? And keep in mind, when an environment gets encrypted, it's not just your data that now is not accessible. It's your environment. It's your network. That's not accessible. Your backup systems are encrypted. Active Directory is often down. Imagine trying to restore services when you don't have Active Directory. So think about it right now. Think about we come in as a consulting firm and we say, hey, uh, we need you to deploy this script to collect a ton of information, forensic artifacts. We're going to try to help you fix all the things. And we say, what do you normally use for deployment? And your answer is, Active Directory. And we say, is Active Directory functional? And you say, no, <laughs> no, it's fully encrypted. And we're like, okay, plan B, what's plan B? That's a big part of planning for ransomware. We talk about that kind of stuff in the course, right? So data exfiltration, 
was something that was made popular by a group named Maze, M-A-Z-E. The Maze crew in early 2019, they started stealing data at, in mass, right? Groups were doing it before, but they're the ones who popularized this. They then use what we sometimes hear as a second level of extortion. Now we just call it data extortion. As opposed to saying, hey, do you want your network back? You want your data back? Rather, they're also saying, oh, and by the way, do you not want us, to, and you take their word for it, to basically just release your data to the public, to all your competitors, to the world, your whatever private things you thought were private are not private anymore, right? About to not be. Or do you want to pay us? That's the second level of extortion. We are seeing some groups who are literally and actively just saying, you know what? We're just not going to do this part right here. Like this guy, we're not going to do it. We're not doing that. We're, we're done with that. And so what they're doing, and this is groups like Ransom House, Cara Kurt, who sprung off of the Conti group. We're seeing Klopp been doing it for a while. And now Beyond Leon is another group. There's an article by the Redacted team. The company's actually called Redacted, by the way. It's a buddy of mine who's one of the authors of it. And they wrote this article. It's called The Evolution of Beyond Leon. That's not the actual name. You get the idea. We could post a link later on. But the article basically shows there was a flaw in the encryption methodology they were using. They rolled their own crypto. That's like, well, you don't roll your own crypto. What are you doing? So someone found the flaw and released a decryptor. Their response was, fine, whatever. They just stopped using encryption. We're just going to be data extortionists now. And so that's what they've been doing for the past couple of months. All right, now what we're seeing is we are seeing a lot of the following. These specifically, they are harassing at scale. I say at scale a lot. I know I'll say it more in this conversation, okay? Because that's what ransomware is. It's at scale attacks. So they are calling your board members, your VIPs. They're calling your customers. They're calling your clients. They're calling your suppliers. You name it, the people you do not want to know that you are in the midst of an attack and then not only your data, but probably their data also has been exfiltrated. They're calling them and they're snitching on you. <laughs> they're like, we got in there and they're not paying us. And they're whiny and they're really mean about it. And it's forcing some hands to make some payments. That, uh, all right. This is an example this of, of an overall ransomware attack. This comes from Mr. Alan Liska, who goes by the name, the ransomware sommelier. I love this guy. He gave me permission to use this diagram. It's from a book that he wrote uh, called Ransomware. Uh, <clears throat> you can find it online. <laughs> I forgot the name of the book. I'm totally blanking on his book right now, but it's uh, like Detect, Prevent, Something Ransomware. Second edition just came out. It's free. You can go grab the PDF. Highly recommend reading it. It's very, very solid for an overview. Not super low depth technical like we train in our class, but it's great. If you leave here and you know what, I learned some stuff about ransomware, ransomware sucks. And people go, how much does it suck? Go look up Alan's book, have him read it. And if you go to my URL for my class and just slash book, I'll have it linked there if it doesn't already. So in here, we get a breakdown. What are the top methods of entry into the environment? Look at that, good old phishing. Oh, phishing is such a classic and so solid and will work forever because it exploits us humans. <laughs> We're lame, it turns out. So credential reuse, stuffing, or brute forcing via remote desktop protocol. I don't specifically, like I, I do specifically mean RDP. I don't just mean remote services. RDP is becoming the bane of our existence. And threat actors are even turning to using it even more so for persistence and getting back into the environment. They're just RDPing from box to box, and it's super annoying. Another way, of course, is the exploitation of a software vulnerability. So this is, of course, doable because, you know, what are your patch cycles? Oh, we patch every six months. No problem. <laughs> like, oh, we're on top of things. Six months is fine. No, that's a problem. So your network perimeter devices need to be patched. Keep in mind your firewalls, your VPNs, your email exchange, well, <clears throat> excuse me, your email systems, whatever they might be, exchange, whatever it might be, those need to be patched. And a lot of people forget that and they focus more on the internal software, which does also need to be patched. But if there's a zero day or if there's some type of, you know, exploit that's out there, you hear in the news, ransomware exploited this zero day vulnerability. No, 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 no. It was a zero day six and a half months ago. It's not a zero day anymore. It's fully patchable. Stop it. Go patch your stuff. I get annoyed. I get annoyed when I see those as entry vectors, if you, can, if you can't tell. So once they get into the environment, what they try to do is deploy tooling 
that's going to help them. One of the things they like to do is use tools that are already in the environment. We call that living off the land binaries and scripts or lol boss for short. And you can actually go to slash lol boss on the, the I'm just going to say slash and then links because I have a ton of them I'm going to mention. I mean, for528.com slash, that's what I mean. So if you go to slash lol boss, you can learn more about that project. What is a lol boss? Well, it's something that's included with the operating system that has secondary means that threat actors like to exploit that wasn't necessarily designed for that purpose, right? That's what that is. So they're using what's already there. They're living off the land. They don't have to bring in tools. On top of that, well, duh, they're bringing in tools. They like to bring in all the tools that we have listed here. And these are very, very common. The ones that are listed here, you will see them in your environment and you will see them not even renamed most of the time. One example I wanna point out just because it tickled my fancy right now is AD Find. It was produced in, I don't know, 2004 or three or something. If you go check out, it's called Joeware is the fellow's website who runs this. If you go look at it, the website looks like it's from the 90s because it is from the 90s. The tool is super old, has not been updated in forever. It's just an LDAP query tool that pulls a bunch of data from Active Directory. And we see it used over and over and over by affiliates for some of the largest groups. Okay, I'll digress on that particular tool. They're targeting primarily Windows, but there's a big shift in the past two years to hit ESXi, to hit your virtualized environments. And the reason there's probably pretty obvious. If they can encrypt a couple servers in one of your ESXi clusters, they can take, take down a multitude of servers that are virtualized. And then, oops, for you, to get data out they're using a number of tools. I'm gonna to cover some specifically, actually they're coming up. They're on the slide here. You can read them and I'll, I'll get the PDF out to folks, right? Uh, I'm gonna cover some of them in detail coming up. Before they deploy the ransomware, they try to disable your recovery mechanisms and destroy your backups. So they will find your backup systems. They'll do port scanning to see if the admin ports for tools like Veeam Backup are in place. I love Veeam. I actually really do like Veeam backup, but unfortunately, so do ransomware actors because they know it's so it's so commonly used, right? They'll target it. They'll look for your Synology NAS devices. They'll look by port and go, ooh, you have a NAS on that, on that IP address. I'm going to go check that out because that's where your files are, right? They'll grab the stuff off of them and they'll encrypt those. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a case and I've found that the backup solution in place is fully encrypted and therefore useless. So a uh, couple things to note, we talk about these in class, but two important things is offsite backups and immutable storage. If you go to slash coveware, C-O-V-E-W-A-R-E, -E, coveware, they made a name for themselves in communications with threat actors, negotiators, basically. They have a great article that that will link you to if you go there that talks about the payments for ransoms going down in 2022. The payments have gone down. They're still 400 something million, uh, but the ransomware attacks have actually been steadily increasing. But in that article, they show that there's been a pointed increase in Google searches for immutable backup throughout the year of 2022. And that's because of ransomware, which if you don't use that, go, go do that. <laughs> it's very important. Once they've destroyed your backups, stopped Windows from being able to recover by using tools like BCD Edit and some other common, easily accessible tools on, in the environment already, they will then, only then, will they deploy the ransomware. And that's if, that's if you're not dealing with a data extortion group that doesn't even do that. And we're seeing that more and more. All right, so what tools are they using? Is anyone familiar? What, what tools do you expect to see in a ransomware attack? My students, you don't, don't cheat. <laughs> like I just learned. Anyone know what tools are common? Cobalt Strike, Co ah, you dirty cheater. <laughs> I saw that. Cobalt Strike is extremely common. We have an entire section on my class on Cobalt Strike. Don't get me wrong, it's a phenomenal tool. It is a commercial penetration testing adversary simulation tool. It was designed to be used by red teams and purple teaming and, and by us, the, the cyber defenders, right? In order to improve our defenses. But guess who found it? <laughs> Duh, the threat actors did and they love it, right? So let's talk a little bit more about some of the tooling that we're seeing in these attacks. First off, there was a paradigm shift. And I just like to say that it makes me sound smart. <laughs> I just like that phrase for whatever reason. 
it was around 2016 ish, at least as far as I can recall, where we stopped seeing so many custom written malware variants dropped into environments and rather threat actors realized I could just go to github.com and get a ton of tools and just use those. Right. I don't know how many times I've seen Mimi cats, your favorite neighborhood password stealing tool that attacks the LSAS process and, and memory space and windows. I've seen that in so many ransomware attacks and many times you'll see it labeled as Mimi cats underscore trunk dot zip, which means they downloaded it right from GitHub. Sometimes they'll do it in your environment. They'll get in, they'll open a browser, they'll go to GitHub. And sometimes you see them run like Google queries and they'll, they'll mistype the name of Mimi Cats. And you're like, come on, man. You can't name the tool you're going to use to completely pwn my network. Get out of here. So they also love to use scripts these days. And the scripts will often leverage tools that they have either brought in or that are already in the environment. See my camera desync. So I'm going to try one of these real quick, see if I get away with it. All right. And we're seeing that they are using emulation and simulation tools. There we go. We're back on track like cobalt strike a new one that was found actually by my group i wasn't there yet so i, I can't take credit but unit 42 found brute retell in an environment and every single scanner when they first found it in an active engagement every single scanner and virus total didn't see anything wrong with it they're like nah it's fine right no it was a brute retell what they call a badger which is basically like a beacon for cobalt strike we're seeing bishop fox's sliver and a lot of engagements and a number of other tools that are probably going to take over a little more of the market share of Cobalt Strike, but their tools are so well known and they're designed to be used primarily for, for us and they're being used by the ransomware actors. We're seeing malware as a service, things like Emitet and Iced ID and QBot, Quackbot, things like that, the old Hanseter kind of things, but we're seeing them actually move away from them more to use standard remote maintenance and monitoring tools or remote monitoring and maintenance, I always transpose it, RMM tools. We see that way too much and it's unnerving because we expect to see those tools in our environment for the most part. But now when you see them, you have to worry why you're seeing them. Threat actors like to bring tools in. When they do so, we're seeing them often do it via file sharing sites. The ones I have listed here on this slide on the left-hand side, these guys are right there. Block those, every single one of those. Block it and alert anytime someone tries to access it. If you see DNS hits to it, find out why. If you see browser history and your EDR or whatever you have, find out why. One of them in particular, that guy right there, Mega, is pretty much, pretty much all bad. I, I actually just learned today that I, I won't mention who they are, Phil, but would it be really very well, not not Phil Dur it was Phil. Um, one of the groups that we use, in fact, we train their software. Apparently they use Mega. Aside from them, it's pretty much pirated software, adult content, and malware. That's all it is. Just block Mega, stop it. And I apologize to that group. And I won't even say your name. <clears throat> so these are all bad. We see an example on the right-hand side of one of them, transfer.sh. They are made as anonymous file sharing sites, basically. A threat actor can go upload data to one of these sites and then use like curl to pull the data down very quickly and efficiently within your organization. Also, there's a project here and it's just slash lots, L-O-T-S. It's run by uh, at least the moniker Mr. Docs. And this is the website here, living off trusted sites. If I sort this by download, by just clicking download, you'll get the plus download right here in the search box. This then gives you a multitude of URLs and domains that you may want to start blocking or start monitoring. Also, in that regard, threat actors will bring tools in from very well trusted sites like Google Drive or Dropbox or Box or shit, whatever, right? So, usually, what you want is to have a policy. Now, no, don't lie. What does almost everyone here use internally for important file transfer? You, no one wants to admit it? Okay, it's email, don't lie. <laughs> you use email, all right? Outside of email, what do you have as an approved file sharing site? Whatever that is, can you block the rest? Yes, you'll have business process problems, especially with groups that work with outside ventures and things of that nature, but can you get away with it? Can you block them as many as you can? Block them, 
because the ransomware actors freaking love them. They're called trusted sites. So why wouldn't they use them? A number of other tools that we find in ransomware cases are listed on this slide. The first one is 7-Zip. Yeah, 7-Zip. Another one, by the way, is WinZip. Tools we've been using for years, including like WinRAR, right? Threat actors love them. And what they do oftentimes is they will actually download them when they're in your environment. So I've shown the list here for a number of reasons for you to become familiar with some of the tools, but also I have the full URLs with the domains in bold. Can you block those domains? Can you alert on those domains? Is that theoretical in your environment? You maybe don't wanna alert every time someone goes to 7-zip.org, but what about joeware.net for AD fine, the second one down? Do your IT admins use that? Keep your eye on it, find out. I recommend for the most part that these are on your list. Notice that AnyDesk is on there. That's an important one. Anyone here use AnyDesk? Can you just say like, yeah, we, we use AnyDesk. It's just a general tool that we use. If you don't, can you stop it from being launched? Can you use AppLocker? Like, can you stop AnyDesk? It's one of the most popular RMMs that threat actors are using. I want to just take a note here to recommend you check out if you just go to slash third party, you'll see the SANS Windows third party app forensics reference guide right there. And it has a number of log locations for specific third party software. Some of the ones we'll be discussing right now. So I recommend you just have that at your disposal as a reference guide. Okay. Before we get too far into the tools, I want to note that many times these threat actors are not renaming their executables. You will see mimicats.exe in your environment all the time. If they do, however, happen to rename them, one of the things they never touch is what's known as the version info resource. It's a resource that's embedded inside the portable executable, meaning the .exe or the DLL itself. It's added at compilation time and they usually never touch it. And it has these fields like description, product, company, and the one I have in bold right there, original file name. And the reason that I put that in bold is because you will see threat actors who don't change that at all. And yet, if they take, for example, anydesk.exe and they name it x.exe, you will still be able to see that field. Where can you see it? You can see that field in your EDR or your XDR if you happen to have it. If you have Sysmon deployed, whenever you have process execution, like event ID ones, you'll see that. And you'll be able to determine at a bird's eye view. Hey, look, that's actually any desk. It's right there, right? So if you can hunt for those, great. And I have these two links here. I'm gonna open them both real quick. They are mappings of common tool names. Let me zoom in here. Let me see if any desk is in here. Any desk is in here. Any desk. Oh, that's a bad example. All right, let me choose something else. Do, 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 do. Let's go with PE view. This tool called PE view has an internal original file name of PE view.exe. If they rename it, you can easily see, oh, that's actually PE view. So I recommend you check out these two links and these two resources. This one called binary rename is this big, huge list. Well, it's not huge, but it's a pretty decent sized list of original file names for you to correlate. Now, let's talk about the tools themselves. The first thing that threat actors typically want to do is bypass your defense mechanisms. In order to bypass those defense mechanisms, they will often use a tool like what you see on the left-hand side. Gmer, Hitman Pro, PC Hunter, and oh, ProcessHacker.exe. We see it so, so often in ransomware cases. Hunt these. They usually don't change the name. They usually just name that. They drop them into your environment, right? Can you stop them from executing? Can you detect them? What telemetry and what visibility do you have in your environment? You do not want those to run. And if you have an IT administrator running them, what are you doing? Why are you running that? They're usually billed as rootkit removers. What are you doing? Oh, I'm testing something. What? What are you? <laughs> just, just tell me, what are, what are you testing? Oh, I can't uninstall the AV you installed on here. Ah, gotcha, right? Like, what are they doing? Stop it. They also will bring in what's known as vulnerable drivers and these, this, Vulnerable driver project. I have these two links in here in the presentation. There's three, what I call the big ones, the big boys. These ones right here. The middle one, this guy right here, that file name. If you ever see that file name in your environment and you don't use a vast, 
or if you do see it and you do use a vast but it's in like some c users public music directory or something silly stop it find out what that is immediately because these drivers have been signed by microsoft they have the ability to unload drivers and the threat actors are bringing them in and then they're using them to unload your endpoint protection your edr your xdr they're stopping it from working and now they can do whatever they want to do here's another example and this is the second link this is the byovd2 link and there's a number of different articles listed at the top in the references and then there's a whole bunch of file hashes and even some file names. I know I'm kind of randomly scrolling until I find a name and I'm over it. All right, so there's a bunch of them in there. And if you can hunt for these throughout your environment, awesome. And then finally, on the right-hand side over there, you see that they're just using like service control and task list. And they're just basically using PowerShell commands. They're just looking for processes that are running and then they just try to kill them. And if they have admin privileges and they're able to kill your AV that way, and you'd be surprised by how many can be killed by just killing the process name, like, that, ah, we're done now and we can do whatever we want. RMMs, commercial RMM tools are becoming huge. With, no, they are. They are huge. They're not becoming anything. All right. The big one just happens to be AnyDesk. And I apologize if anyone out there is watching and you're like, I work. For, what the heck? <laughs> you're like, hey, man. It's a great tool. It's just potentially too great, I guess. So in that Conti manual, I think it was step, I don't remember exactly which number it was. I think it was actually step three in that manual. It shows the threat actors how to download any desk and how to install it. That's how common it is. But all these other ones, Atera, LogMeIn, ConnectWise, all the things you expect to see in many large IT environments can be very bad for you. So what do you use? Do you have a policy on what you allow? And obviously for the other ones, what do you do? Stop it. Don't let them use those because if they get those into your environment, they have persistence, they have elevated access, they can run remote control commands, they can then spread further in the environment and so on and so forth. Here's some examples. If you do run across these during your analysis, I provided there, by the way, the third party poster has a number of these but I've also provided some log locations for these. So if you run into any desk, there are some logs that you can go look for, like these guys, ad.trace and ad underscore service or svc.trace. Those are little snitches, they're awesome. They show IP addresses coming and going, they'll show file transfer data, they'll show you all kinds of great stuff that you can use to then know exactly what the threat actor was doing. Many times these tools are installed they're not even using portable versions of them. They're actually installing them. So if you run like an SECM report, you'll see they're installed all over your environment. You're like, hey, what's that right there? And then, you know, whoops, take care of it. I would be remiss if I didn't mention these two specific presentations. So the Establishing Connection Illuminating Remote Access presentation and the Legitimate Rats presentation, they're fan fantastic and they're super super pertinent and useful for ransomware analysis so i wanted to give them a moment to shine and oh i see a camera wait for it go ahead no i was waiting for you are you done now no i'm kidding <laughs> all right cool all right so all hail the king ps exec is the king of lateral movement moving throughout your organization and of deploying the actual cryptor, the payload in your environment. It's used for so much and it just sucks for us. So what do we do? How do we deal with it? I want you first to really know how it works. Many people have used PS exec, but may not be familiar with exactly how it works. There's a lot of technical details on the next two or three slides here. I have references and I'm gonna get the PDF out to whatever powers it be, Stephen, folks who can help disperse it, you know, to whoever wants this. But in order for PS exec to work, the environment has to be configured a certain way. File sharing has to be enabled. Simple file sharing has to be disabled. Administrative shares need to be enabled. And yet, guess what? Most environments are configured that exact way, right? So on top of that, when PS exec runs, there's a very specific set of uh, processes that occur what actually happens is you're technically via SMB copying an executable to the remote destination computer. 
And thus, if you're using PS Exec for response, you are stomping on disk artifacts and memory artifacts. Just a heads up on that. So what happens first is a server message block session is open and you have the admin dollar sign share to, to which psexesvc.exe is actually uploaded. And from there, a named pipe is open to the service control manager. Whoop, oh goodness, Ryan. And the service control manager is told, hi there, I'd like you to make a new service. And I want you to use that file I just uploaded as the handler for it. And I want you to run it now. When that service runs, named pipes are then created in memory. Those pipes are then used for inter-process communication or IPC. And they allow then the communication bidirectional between those two hosts. If you're copying data, that's how it works. If you're running remote commands, that's how it works. I'm not gonna cover the individual details on the next two or three slides. I just want them to be in the PDF so that if you're interested, then you can basically see it. This is a very detailed overview of exactly what happens when PS exec runs. And the next slide, or the next two slides, show at the network level exactly what happens. These are phenomenal resources. I'm obsessed with them. I just wanted to make sure they were at your disposal, basically. And I have links to the articles where they came from. One of the articles is no longer available. So I found it on the Internet Wayback Machine, and they gave you a link to that because I want you to see that content. It's really cool stuff. All right, so SMB, the dollar sign shares that are going to be used. How does that all, why does that all matter to us? It's important to understand what protocols are at play and what files are being written. Why? Because we can use that all for detection, all right, which is the very next slide coming up after this guy. This slide shows how PS exec might be used for deployment. And what I want to do, when I say deployment, I mean specifically taking the ransomware cryptor and pushing it out, deploying it throughout your organization, right? So in the first example here, or better yet, I'm going to go with the second example. Let's zoom in here. We have the start command, which just starts a new command session, technically in a new window session. We have psexec.exe. You see this dash D right there. That's important. It's kind of a heads up. That means run the following commands, but don't wait until they're done. Just go ahead and run them. Because otherwise, if the threat actor was trying to push ransomware to say a thousand hosts, it would have to wait until the ransomware sample is finished running on the first host. That's ridiculous, right? They just want to start it all over the place. The next thing that we see here is we see an at sign on the command line. That at sign right there tells PS exec, this is a text file and each line of this text file is a target host for you. And that text file is usually generated slash created in your victim and you're the victim, right? In your environment. They'll use angry IP scanner, advanced IP scanner, very common tools, and they'll find either the host names or the IPs. They'll put them in a text file and they'll pass them like this to PS exec. You then see a username and a password, and then something like a command to run. In this case, they're running something from Windows temp called x.exe. Well, how did it get there? Right before that, you will have seen a previous command. And in this case, this would be run on the domain controller. And they're taking from the domain controller x.exe and they're pushing it to C Windows temp x.exe on every host in that target list. So you'll see a series of commands oftentimes. Sometimes they'll bunch them together. But it's basically, hey, copy this to all these machines and then go ahead and run it, right? In this case, these are taken directly from a case that I worked. The only thing I changed was the username and the password. This is from our, uh, our range. We use a, a company called Samaran Protect, hence the name you see. And that password, I thought I was being cute. So that's the password. All right, how do you detect PS exec? This is why we covered what we just covered to talk about this slide here. All right, first up, if you have visibility into process creations, and by the way, who has that? Can I see a show of hands? Who can see what processes ran with command lines? There's about, for the folks who are not in the room, there's like a sixth or a seventh of the room, if that, that raise their hands. If you have EDR or you have XDR, hopefully it's doing that for you. If you have Sysmon, okay? Another option is to enable what's known as process auditing. And process auditing will provide these event IDs. 4688 means a process just ran, and you can include the command line with the process that just ran. Just a heads up, 
If you have a log aggregated environment, you are going to blow up your aggregator with a ton of logs, all right? So if you're paying for a license, like, you know, I don't know, Splunk, then it could be very, very expensive for you. First off, I love Splunk. I just, I just can't afford it. So, all right, also if you have Sysmon and if you don't check out Sysmon, go to slash Sysmon on my little URL shortener and see the configuration I've provided there. And uh, sysmon-xml is a configuration file. I love sysmon. So if you have that visibility, great. However, you can also just look for file creations. And this could be during manual analysis, just looking at the master file table, the MFT, or the USN and journal and J files. This is stuff you learn about in 508, 608, or 500, 508, 608, a lot of our courses actually. So you can also look for the service creation. Recall that on the remote machine, it's going to create a service. That service is typically going to be called PSEXESVC. Remember you upload that file via SMB, technically you push it over and then you create that service. These event IDs, especially 7045, and then oddly enough, there's a secondary one. They log very, very similar things, but they're, a service was installed basically, created. And if you see those, you might see information like, the handler for that service and the name of that service. Here's the name, there's the handler, and you can identify. Another thing is that every time you run a sys internals tool, there's in the current user registry hive, which will be the nt user dot dat registry hive, there will be in software, sys internals, and then the name of the tool. And in this case, we have PS exec. You'll see EULA accepted, end user license agreement accepted. And that's because you have to accept a visual GUI pop-up that says, hey, this is our license, you agree to it, right? If they do that, regardless if it pops up, that key will be created and it's indicative that yes, that ran. That key's modified time will be at the very least the first time that it ran on that host, at least theoretically. Another thing is if you have command line capture, you can look for strings like dash accept EULA. This is a method threat actors use to not have to worry about the pop-up on the remote machine. They'll pass it as a parameter, even if they rename PS exec to something like p.exe or farts.exe, because I'm a mature adult. <laughs> if they do that, you'll still see them pass it on the command line, dash except EULA. And if you find that, it's a pretty good indication you just found a renamed PS exec. And then finally, there's a number of pipes. Well, not finally, we cover a lot more in course, but finally for now, there are a number of pipes that get created. A lot of folks don't have visibility into pipes. If you happen to have that visibility, it creates a number of them that all begin with PSE, XE, SVC. Boop, boop. All right, now we move on to data access and exfiltration. And I can just tell right now that I'm gonna go a little bit past the top of the hour because I have a tendency to run my mouth, if you haven't noticed yet. All right, so data access. Threat actors love to create archives in order to take data out, okay? One of the things they will do is they will bring tools in, in addition to just using the methods in Windows. PowerShell has a compressed dash archive. It's a commandlet, it's built in. They can just use that. If you can monitor for that, and it will probably be in your EDR, or it'll be because you have already enabled uh, module logging, which is event ID 4103. You have to enable that in order to see that. But they'll bring in WinZip and 7-Zip. And if they do, it might be useful for you because both of these tools have registry locations that will sometimes keep an archive history. A note, this is an example on the right-hand side of the screen. Well, it's already highlighted, so I just kind of double highlighted it, but that's all right. This is an archive history and then you can see here, and I'll double highlight it again, why not, of the archives that were created. As a note, there is a command line version of 7-zip called 7-z-a, as in like alpha dot exe. If they use that, the registry doesn't get updated. Why not? I don't know, 7-zip, I don't know, if I, like fix it. Another tool that you'll see is WinRAR, good old WinRAR, right? When you were pirating software back in the 90s, you were probably using WinRAR. So WinRAR also has a registry key location, and it's simply in the NT user uh, hive at software WinRAR arc history. So check those things out because they can be extremely useful. One thing that's very hard to tell in a ransomware case is what did they take? What did they archive? But if you just go to a registry location and you have all the names of the folders that they compressed, awesome.
Another thing that they do these days is they use cloud-based sharing sites. Remember that project called Lots, Living Off Trusted Sites? They use trusted file sharing sites to download their tools into your environment, and they use the same darn sites to take your stuff out. So I have some examples of the ones we see, but again, just see that slash lots site and block what you can block. As an example, I worked a case for a group called Monty. When Conti closed up shop, this Monty group came into existence. I'm really proud of the analysis. If you go to slash Monty, M-O-N-T-I, you'll see a blog article that I co-wrote with Anuj Sony, who's the author of Forensic 710 and co-author of 610. I love Anuj. Hey man, if you ever see this, I like you. All right, so anyways, not creepy at all, that's fine. All right, so in this case, we were looking at Chrome browser history and we saw a URL at dropmefiles.com.ua. And it had some numbers after it. It looked kind of semi-random. And I was like, what's that? So I got the client's permission and I went there. And what did I find? I found an LSAS.dump file that was taken directly out of the client's environment. The threat actor failed to delete the file after they exfiltrated it and you know basically stole it. I got access to it. I was able to find that by looking at Chrome browser history and being cognizant of share my files. What's our drop me files, excuse me, sorry. Uh, why is that in there? And then I actually was able to run that through Mimi Cats and I found four, that's three, four, <laughs> numbers are hard. I found four NT hashes that the reactor was then technically had access to. And I didn't know two of those accounts could potentially have been used. I looked more into those accounts and we exposed additional lateral movement all by looking through the browser history, which showed me that this site was used to exfiltrate data. Here are some locations for your favorite tools, FileZilla and WinSCP. I, I don't know if you can name a decent sized IT group where these aren't in play. I have them both on my laptop right now, not for class purposes. Like I just use them. I use them at home, right? Very common tools, threat actors love them. They use standard FTP a lot of times to take your files out. Like FTP, what year is this? Get out of here, right? So they love these things. And these have little snitchy locations. You have log files on the screen. I'll give the PDF out. You can find some remote destinations and it could be super useful if you do run into them. And by the way, these tools are primarily named filezilla.exe and winscp.exe. And you can look up those original file names and those links I provided previously. If they rename them, they often don't. All right, another tool they use to take your data out is called Megasync. Mega is a, Megasync is Mega's first party tool that they use for file synchronization. And it's very commonly found in ransomware along with another tool called rclone. I'm gonna digress on rclone because like we're already getting long winded here, okay? So Mega has a bunch of locations that are also wonderful little snitches and I've provided a list. So grab those. If you do find Megasync in the environment, you could potentially find all the files they've synchronized. And it's super handy to provide that to like legal counsel. All right, and then finally, we have two slides that are pretty quick here for general hunting. I think some of the folks in my class may know what one of them is. <laughs> it's comspec, man. But there's a number of locations that third actors love to drop their files to, their tools, your data that they're about to steal, all kinds of stuff. Okay, first up, environment variables that they like to use, app data and program data and temp, just percent temp, which by the way, if they're using the system account, it will not be the standard user temp. It'll actually be Windows temp. Just a heads up on that. They love those. Another thing that they really like to use is C users public. The public user folder is there so that any user can access files that are in that directory structure, right? So they love to put malware stuff in there so they can access them no matter what on the system. And then Phil Moore, that guy over there for people in the room, look at it, make him uncomfortable. Phil is here co-teaching and he's your local resident Australia teacher, essentially instructor is what we call ourselves for 528. And he mentioned a while back perp logs and I see it more and more and more these days. It, there, usually there's nothing even in there. And so you'll often find EXEs and DLLs and .text files. They're creating all kinds of fun stuff. So I have some other examples in here and I just wanna mention that they do love to run things out of these directories. One that I really, really want to mention though, 
is the user profile, whatever it may be, video, videos, music, and pictures. Look for, and I have here a regular expression to look for EXEs, DLLs, BAT files, PS1 files, PowerShell scripts. Look for basically anything that you might think they're bringing into the environment. They love to use those silly directories. You'll see Mimi Cats and Cobalt Strike and all kinds of stuff running out of C users public music. And you're like, no, like it seems obvious, and it is once you find it, but just a heads up. And then finally, my favorite. There's an environment variable. Everyone in my class is like, ah, oh, I'm done. <laughs> I, I mentioned this like five times a day, and here it is again. There's an environment variable called comspec, and it actually points to the command interpreter or command.exe living in system 32. Threat actors don't want to often type in command.exe because you know, you'll see that, right? They try to be sneaky by referencing comspec. And if you see percent comspec percent used pretty much at all in your environment, it's a decent fidelity. Go look for that. Whatever tooling and methodologies you have, look for comspec running in command lines or found in scripts. It's usually very not common, is what I'm trying to say. It's usually uncommon for IT admins and third party software to do that. Go look for comspec. It's a huge win if you find a threat actor using comspec and a number of post attack and exploit frameworks love to use it. All right, and that takes us to the final reminder that, hey, we have a ransomware summit coming up June 23rd of this year. We'd love to have you all there. It's free, it's virtual, just come hang out, right? We'll record the talks, but it'd be nice to have you there live. And that is the end of the presentation. So, thank you. Grab a drink there, Ryan. Wait your whistle, mate. Thank you. And was I wrong? Seriously, how entertaining was that? How engaging was that? And and thank you, Ryan, for that. Mm -hmm. So we'll let you catch your breath while we uh, ask people in the online session who are attending this remotely, if you have any questions, now's the time to type them into your Q&A window. We will try our best to get to a few of those noting the time uh we did have one throughout the presentation ryan which is essentially saying can we get some of those links made available and i'll, I'll chat with you and catch up about the right way yep. to do that so thank you to that anonymous questioner but we'll, we'll find a way to get those links shared and sent out so stay tuned for more on that uh in the room throw your hand up if you'd like to ask a question or i'll run the microphone over to you there we go there's the got to be some guy right? All the way at the back. Oh, he meant right. Look at him go. Not me parking and panting. I'm not that unfit. Then. Oh, yeah. Thanks for the presentation, Ryan. It's really good. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could talk a bit about timelines, uh, just broadly, or generally speaking, how much time do you have between, say, an initial access broker getting access to your environment, then publishing it, then getting owned, basically? Yes. Did the online folks hear that question? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So the question basically is a dwell time is what we call it. So how long is the threat actor in your environment? And dwell time can at this point range from hours to weeks or months. You mentioned in true, or initial access brokers, IAB. So that expands the dwell time potentially quite a bit. So for example, you can go to thedeferreport.com. It's a website that I'm only slightly obsessed with. And outside of, I'm going to say, I'm going to put it out there, outside of taking Forensics 528, the best hands-down training you can get is going to the deferreport.com and just reading every single article. It's phenomenal. It's a group of volunteers. They have honeypots, honey networks, and they let threat actors come in. They're extremely well-tooled environments. They've got all kinds of telemetry and bells and whistles, right? Same stuff we use in, the, in our lab, actually. And then they do a full write-up of the incident and they just publish it all for free. I actually support them via Patreon. That's how much I like them. I think I give them like 30 bucks a month or something. It gets me access to their Intel repo, enough selling them to, <laughs> I'm like on a sales pitch right now. I love them. Anyways, they have a number of articles on, I think it's either Re Ryuk or Revil, where one of them was five hours, one was eight hours, one was less than 24 hours. And this is basically from the time of initial infection into whoops, everything's encrypted, right? And data being taken out and sometimes plentiful like gigabytes, tens of gigs of, of data, right? When you have initial access brokers coming into the environment, the dwell time can range and it's typically based on how 
how juicy your environment is on the darknet marketplaces. You can see those sitting there for months and just not selling, and then others will sell like right away. So we have seen basically dwell times of months and months. We've seen up upwards of six months. A lot of times we don't even, we're not even able to identify when the heck did someone eventually originally get in. We see an RDP session initiated with credentials, not brute force. We just see RDP come in and we go, hey, how'd they get those creds? You know, we check for phishing avenue, we check for all the fun bells, all the things we can, and we just can't find it. And it's super frustrating. So typically dwell time was like five to seven days for ransomware is, is a usual time. Three to five, we're seeing almost even more now, especially with the data extortion groups. But when you have an IEB coming to your environment, it can be weeks or months. And a lot of times it really depends on how much people wanna buy access to your network. And that access is typically sold with things, they don't mention like your group, company X because they know threat researchers like us will go to the darknet marketplaces, see that and just contact the group and be like, hey, go fix that, right? So they'll list like the country you operate in, your vertical or your sector, like what do you do? Your construction, healthcare, those are the big you know, ticket items these days for threat actors, unfortunately. But if you have something that may not necessarily spark enough interest, it can sit and sit and sit. So the question, the answer is really the very wide spectrum all over the place. Thanks, guys. Sorry, Ryan, just a point of clarification, the forensics528.com shares. Yes. Accessible to everybody or only to, okay, got it. Everyone, the uh, for528.com slash share, everything there is accessible. There's one zip file that will require a password. You don't get that. That's for the class. Everything else, if you can read it, it's yours. Excellent. All righty, back to the room. Any questions? We've got one right up front. I'm going to do that. Thanks, Ryan. I actually really enjoy also the Palo Alto Unit 42 every time when they get yeah. messages. <laughs> you know. Anyway, I just would like to ask a quick question about TikTok. Mm -hmm. Like, as you know, many people, uh, any many countries around the world now like racing and like banning them, especially from the government sites and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, can you uh, like give your insights about what what do you think of this from your ransomware experts expertise or ever have you ever been deep dive into this and what have you found in a roundabout way i can so it, <laughs> bear with me here so the whole big thing about TikTok that most folks are worried about is that it's a foreign nation entity that's quote unquote unfriendly with many of the folks and the users who are accessing it like i'm from the united states and then from here probably very similar situations um except for land ownership things here. But the real big thing that comes down to is that, was, I didn't mean to be like, it's true, right? I was trying to be rude about it. But one of the things that you have to focus on is people are worried about the, the amount of data that they're amassing about people outside their country. But in reality, the way that I see it, the amount of data that data brokers already have on every single person sitting in this room is so daunting that that my daughter is interested in uh you know horse uh, english horse riding and these certain kinds of helmets and these things and this kinds of humor i don't even care at this point data brokers have freaking everything on us all our likes and dislikes and the clicks and stupid things if you're not familiar with data brokers and exactly what they are there's a show on uh, i don't know hbo showtime called uh, last week tonight with john oliver is that the name of it right and there's an episode called data brokers and it will blow your mind you maybe don't want to watch it if you like it's it's unnerving so when people ask you know how is that going to potentially affect ransomware the ransomware actors a lot of them will use targeted methods but also a lot of them are more just kind of wide net approach and they'll buy access from dark net marketplaces not even really knowing which company you are you know they'll be like oh they're in the fitness industry they're based in australia done and they'll be like all right I'll buy the RDP credentials, I'll buy the VPN access, and I'll just go ransom them, you know, and they don't really know what they get until they get in. So while things like, and it's not just TikTok, obviously, just social media in general, but the amount of cookies that we're all agreeing to, you know, if they change those, like, do you accept the cookies? And you know, if you click no, then you have to make all these stupid preference selections. You don't do that. You just click accept all. Don't lie. <laughs> so there's so, don't lie. There's so much data on us that like with TikTok, I, I don't even worry about it. 
uh, that's on a personal, you know, response kind of thing. I, I think as far as ransomware is concerned, that the primary targets are already very well known. And they're very well known from a lot of publicly traded kinds of things. And if it's not that, it's other groups being popped or being pwned or compromised. And then the documents they pull from there, they're already learning all they want about the business side of things. TikTok, as far as ransomware, I don't see it being a problem. Thank you for the talk. Um, so from, I guess, last year. Oh, oh, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. A little tap tap. So thank you for the talk. Um, since around last year, you saw Microsoft and since then some other nation states are alluding to hacking back, essentially. Uh, start alluding to hacking back for ransomware crews, right? Yes. Um, what effect do you think they'll have towards, as in, will that make them more likely to hack, uh, say, a country that will hack back or less likely? Yeah. Okay. So the question involving hack back, are you folks familiar with the concept in general of hacking back? is when threat actors come into an environment and then basically the entities who are either the victims or the ones who are helping them or whatever, basically just turn on the threat actors and go, no, that sucks. I see your infrastructure. I'm going to take it down or I'm going to annoy you or I'm going to send you false credentials or whatever. I've personally seen retribution for hackback. Now, in the general sense, we can't openly for the, I don't know about Australian laws, but like I can't openly talk about like, I've seen this group do it and that group like, it, no. But what I know is that the ransomware actors are prideful. And I mean, prideful, right? There's one who goes by the name of, can I say that? Yeah, it's Baster Lord. And this person is a Lockbit affiliate and they just recently retired. They put out a little really, oh, I'm retiring, but I personally, you know, hand selected these other affiliates that are part of my group, my little affiliate group, they're taking over for me. And here's how it's all going to, they're super prideful. They want to be successful. And when you mess with them, they take it personally, very personally. And so groups that are trying to hack back are trying to implement OPSEC as much as absolutely possible. Now I can say without saying that there's a ton of it occurring, but typically from a, a victim organization to directly do it would be a horrible idea. And I would recommend completely against it. But we, I, I do see it and I have seen instances of that and I've seen just general things like just trying to DOS a C2 server, right? Like they're using Cobalt Strike team server. And so a, a victim goes, well, I, I don't want you to mess with anyone else. So I'm gonna DOS just the standard DOS, you know, to your C2 server. And there's been retribution for that and more harassment. The more and more that we're seeing harassment with this, you know, less than 2% to 20% of harassment and data extortion only in 2022, the more they're just going to keep doing it. And the more that they're just going to keep like poking on the chests and they're just, they're not going to stop. And so, yeah, I, I see it as, as a lose-lose situation. You have to definitely know who you're working with and not do it first party. I mean, at all. I meant to say, don't do it at all. <laughs> that's what I meant to say. Don't do it at all. That's that's what I meant. So that was a maybe. <laughs> right. No, yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yep. Um, guys, we are asked for clarification on the URL for deeperreport.com. Yes, it's the T H E and then defer D F I R, like digital forensics and incident response. Report R E P O R T dot com. The defer report dot com. Thank you, Questioner. You're also getting a lot of love from the Ryan Chapman fan club in Melbourne. Thank you, Cos. <laughs> uh, Cos, we'll be down your way um, in August of this year. So hopefully we'll get some more Com Nights happening down in Melbourne as well and broadcast those. We've got another question. If we banned crypto, would ransomware go away? <laughs> <laughs> I can't hear or see you. <laughs> If we ban crypto, personally, I, I don't think it will. Um, so, threat, okay, okay. Ah, there you are. <laughs> All right, if we ban crypto, will ransomware go away? I do not believe it will. I believe that threat actors are resourceful and all it takes to see how this might work is look at the drug cartels around the world. Uh, I don't see, th like I see the possibility of backdrops in the future, like literally, I, I don't see why that wouldn't be a thing. Right. It makes some people like that's outlandish. Not if you've seen some of the cartel documentaries that I've seen on TV, like, I mean, 
I think they'll find ways to get paid. Ransomware, when it first started, payment was requested via gift cards, right? It would be like the red dot cards, if you're familiar with those, and then it was like Apple cards and things like that, right? And as they evolved when crypto came about, all of a sudden it was this explosion. Now, right now, well, they started with Bitcoin, right? BTC, and now they've moved primarily to Monero. Does anyone know why? The OSINT folks were, yeah, it's far more difficult to track, right? So let's just say outright Bitcoin, all those, just like crypto just ev evaporates and goes away. Just try to think about how criminals right now are paid. And unfortunately, it's not always via a currency that we'd like to think about. Uh, kind of leave it at that. But they're they're going to have ways to receive payment. Now, think about a lot of the money the financial gain that comes via ransomware, what does it go to, All right? There's a number of them. There, a lot of these people are well, they're actually known, right? They're not well known in the public, but they're known, right? We have their profiles. We have their like Russian state ID pictures. We have pictures of them. Their spouses post on Instagram. These people are tracked. Some of them are very well tracked and known. We just can't do a damn thing about it, right? So what do they do with a lot of this money? Fancy cars, stupid things. Uh, expensive weapons that may look cool, but probably stupid for them to own them, like, you know, that kind of thing, right? But a lot of the finances in certain groups are going to places that uh, maybe not the, the best to fund things that we don't you know, want to really talk about. It's like with BEC, business email compromise, a lot of the Nigerian groups, the, their money where it's funneled, it's just all bad, all bad stuff. All right, so what could they, how could they get payment? I see that them actually getting physical currency and I see bag drops and I, I see current, uh, basically, you know, fly a plane here, drop it off for the bigger organizations. Now, how's that gonna apply to a local dentist office, right? I need to send a 747 for like, it's not gonna happen, right? So do I think it'll go away? No, I just personally think that they're so darn resourceful that they'll find ways to still profit off of it and that it might even blow our minds how they do it. Now, will it be a major impact? to ransomware theoretically oh heck yeah yeah exactly and the same can be said like you know if we stop paying ransoms outright would they go away of course but is that theoretical no right um so yeah there's by the way if you go to slash do you pay there is a debate with four of us from sands myself jake williams and I'm completely blanking right now. I apologize to the other two. And there's four Sands folks involved in a debate. We chose sides. I chose never pay the ransom, although I know it doesn't work that way. And we all basically devolved into debating and like pros and cons. And we kind of didn't do a proper debate, but we really discussed like sometimes you have to pay yeah, and why and things of that nature. So I recommend checking out that video. And there's a lot of questions in general about should you pay? And I'm just going to avoid that one now. <laughs> before so should you pay the ransom I'm like oh. on that note you've just reminded us has anyone in the room does anyone in the room remember the old red team versus blue team com nights we used to do here i think it's about time we revived the good old sans panel debate at our com night thank you for oh, the reminder cool. of that stay tuned we'll do that uh i reckon at one of our upcoming aussie events guys yeah it's it's, it's always a lot of fun <laughs> right um Online attendees, you've you've got a couple of minutes to drop in any final questions while we do one final question from the room. If anyone's keen, is there a hand? Is it two for? There me? is. I uh, just thought I'd ask: uh, Have you ever seen trusted insiders uh, with malicious intent or physical access used in ransomware? Yes, yes, and yes, yes, so and yes. Like Yes, I, I didn't even mean to cut you off. I was so excited. Yes, I have seen that. So um, that's another thing that we're seeing as the evolution. If you go look at the Palo Alto Networks you know, Unit 42 report this year that we just released, and I'll I have to put a shortened URL to it. Uh, I'll, I'll do a shortened URL to report 23. I'll, I'll make that active like before I leave tonight or whatever. But if you check out that report, the overall team, I wasn't actually involved in the report directly, by the way. Uh, but uh, in that we make assumptions basically like we make uh visions at the end of the future like what's going to happen with ransomware and one of the things that we have in there is basically just is just that and so i do believe i think i just completely blanked out in the question that's hilarious whoa that was ridiculous everything just went blank <laughs> like where am i who's that guy <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm so sorry for that. That was really weird. I think I'm tired. Maybe that's the jet lag. All right, trusted insiders. In the class, we actually show an example where there's an email, a spam, basically kind of a mouse spam net sent out. And it's like, hey, you want to make a million bucks? You know, and it basically says, if you would deploy ransomware, then we'll give you a big cut of the profits. And what they were using is a ransomware sample that came directly from github.com called Rasnet, which is our lab 1.1 in the class. We use Rasnet. And so someone basically, a threat actor, if you call them that, <laughs> lame, they found that and they were like, huh, I wonder if I can get people to just install this. And they just sent an email out. And I'm like, wait a minute, we cover that in our lab. <laughs> That's not even a real ransomware. Well, it is technically. Um, but yes, in the uh, global predictions, that's what I was trying to look for. I was looking for the word predictions, and that's what made me go blank. That's so stupid. But anyways, that's one of the predictions is there's going to be more and more insiders because threat groups are moving more towards you and you, maybe me at some point, which would be hilarious. I can't wait. The human, they're attacking us. And so you see these SIM swapping groups and these smishing groups. And they're calling help desk centers and they're attacking humans and they're like hey this is so and so and blah blah and they're getting them to bypass you know mfa and things like that we see that uh, working a case right now with a group called scattered spider and that's how they got in to one of the elevated accounts we're going to see threat actors do that they're going to start calling people guaranteed they're going to start calling people so i yes i absolutely have seen it and we do believe we put the prediction in the report we do believe it's going to happen more What's your question again? 